Travel Tools. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carol and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. Highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. I hope you're all having an amazing day and let's get right into today's story. In January 2002, Brenda Van Dam spent the afternoon with her daughter Danielle. Danielle was seven years old and she was a very typical seven-year-old girl. She loved doing a lot of activities. She loved playing the piano. She loved playing with her brothers and her friends and she just really was a sweet and adorable kid and she was also a Girl Scout. So on this afternoon, Brenda and Danielle were going door to door in their neighborhood selling Girl Guide cookies. They lived in Saber Springs, California, which is a suburb of San Diego. They had gone around the neighborhood and Danielle was really excited about how many cookies that she had sold. So they were about to head home when they made their last stop to a house that was two houses down from theirs. Danielle went up excited, knocked on the door, and the man that answered the door was 49-year-old David Westerfield. He was a very wealthy man who lived alone. He was quite an intelligent person. He held several patents, and this uh, ended up making him quite a bit of money. So when Danielle went up to sell the cookies, he was more than happy to buy some of her Girl Scout cookies. At first, the interaction seemed pretty normal, but then David started having conversations with Brenda, the mother, that were odd and extremely inappropriate. He had said to Brenda that he was aware that Brenda and her husband were into a swingers lifestyle. And it was true that Brenda and her husband were into this, but it just felt very inappropriate and strange that this man that she barely knew was bringing this up to her and bringing it up to her in front of her seven-year-old daughter. Because although Brenda and her husband had had, you know, sexual encounters with other couples, they were very safe about it. This was not, they weren't having strangers come into their home. They weren't having any of these people around their children. And, David was just extremely inappropriate. Who's talking about anything sexual in front of a seven-year-old? During the conversation, Brenda mentioned to David that her husband Damon and their oldest son were planning a trip to go out of town snowboarding. She was hoping that she would be able to get a babysitter so that her and a couple of her friends could go out and have a girls' night that weekend. Once Brenda had mentioned that she was hoping to have a girls' night, David brought up the bar Dad's Cafe and Steakhouse, questioning is that where that, you know, she was going to be going out with her friends. And that was Brenda's favorite place to go out when she did have the opportunity to go out with her girlfriends. And David had said to her that he may show up there and to let if she had any single friends know that there was a very wealthy man who would be interested in entertaining them. Then David started bringing up to Brenda that he would have adult parties at his home. And at this point, Brenda was like, okay, this guy's a creep. This is weird. And so she just thanked him for buying the cookies and her and Danielle headed home. When Brenda got home, she talked to her husband, Damon, about the very strange conversation that he was having. And, he, you know, they just kind of brushed it off as, you know, he's kind of a creepy guy and we'll just try not to have too much interaction with him. Two days later, which was Friday, and this was the weekend that her husband and her oldest son were supposed to be going out of town, but the trip ended up getting canceled. So she had a couple of her girlfriends come over to the house. So Brenda's friends came over, they had a couple drinks, they went outside, smoked a bit of the devil's lettuce, and were just getting kind of ready to go. And they were ready for to go out to their girls' night. So at 10 p.m., Brenda and her friends were ready to go out. And Damon, her husband, was going to stay home with Danielle and Danielle's two older brothers. So the women ended up going to the bar that I had mentioned earlier, which was Dad's Cafe and Steakhouse. 
Once they arrived, the women were having a really good time. You know, they were letting their hair loose, they were dancing, having some drinks. And then someone brought over drinks to them and said that they had been purchased for them. And it turned out that David Westerfield was at the bar and had bought these drinks and sent them over to Brenda and her friends. The women thanked David for the drinks and they continued dancing and Brenda and David ended up dancing together. And Brenda started to notice that David would get extremely frustrated and it seemed angry when other men would come up and give attention to Brenda and her girlfriends that were all out having a good time. So at that point, he kind of went sort of to the other area inside of this bar and he just watched Brenda and her friends. Now, Brenda and her friends, they weren't paying attention to David. They were having fun. They were dancing. They were playing pool. And, you know, they were just, this was like their night out to enjoy themselves and they weren't worried about David sitting in the corner watching them. Around 11.30, the women decided that they wanted to go outside and smoke a bit more of the devil's lettuce. When the women came back into the bar, they then noticed that David was no longer there. And it was kind of a collective sigh of relief because he had been kind of getting a bit creepier as the night had progressed. So they were happy that he was gone and they were free to just enjoy themselves and not have to worry about the creepy guy sitting in the corner watching them. So Brenda and her friend they ended up staying at the bar until about 2 a.m. And then obviously they go home. When Brenda and her girlfriends returned to the home, Brenda noticed that the side door to the garage was open, but she didn't really think anything of it. She thought, you know, earlier when they had kind of been going in and out of the house, smoking the devil's lettuce, that one of them had just left the door open. So it really wasn't even a thought. She just closed the door and the women went inside and they started to have a few more drinks. After about 30 minutes, everybody was getting tired. So Brenda's friends all left and Brenda and Damon went upstairs and went to bed. About an hour later, Damon woke up because he could hear the dog making noises downstairs. So he went downstairs to check on the dog to see what was going on. When he got down there, he noticed that the house alarm was not on. And he also noticed that the back door was left open a crack. And he, the same way Brenda had thought when she had seen the garage door open, he had assumed that earlier when the women had been going outside to smoke, that one of them had just left the door open. So he closes the door, he goes back up to stairs, he goes to bed and he does not think, you know, anything suspicious is going on at all. But he could not have been more wrong. The next morning, the family wakes up and Brenda and Damon are downstairs. They're making breakfast. They're kind of waiting for the kids to wake up. It's Saturday morning, so nobody's in a rush to do anything. And they sit down to have breakfast. And at this point, it's Brenda and Damon and their two sons. But Danielle has not come downstairs yet. And they don't really think much of it. She did enjoy sleeping in and it was Saturday morning. Eventually, Brenda said to one of the sons, go up upstairs and check on your sister and let her know that breakfast is ready. Danielle's brother came downstairs and told his parents that Danielle was not in her room. Brenda was instantly concerned so she went right up to her daughter's bedroom to check for herself and when she went in she saw that her daughter was not in her bed. They quickly checked around the house and Danielle was nowhere to be found and Danielle was a very good kid. She wasn't a kid who had ever you know left the house on her own or anything like that. So just before 10 a.m. Brenda called 911 and the police instantly showed up at the house and and everybody was on alert. It was a very tight knit community that the family lived in. So immediately word spread and hundreds of people came out to help search 
for Danielle. They ended up setting up a command center at a local real estate agent office. And that's where people, you know, they would go there and they would say, okay, you go here and search this area. So they were, you know, it was a, a search where, you know, obviously it's being conducted by the police, but the public is very much wanting to help. So they're sending out people to different areas to search for Danielle. By the end of the day, there were over 2,000 people helping to search for Danielle. The police had gone door to door as soon as Danielle was reported missing, and there was only one neighbor that they had not spoken to, and that was David Westerfield. So police go to ask him where, you know, where have you been? Have you seen Danielle? Just asking everything that they could think of. And David had a really weird explanation for where he was. So he owned a motor home and, but he didn't keep it at his house. The motor home was kept in another area and it was about a half an hour drive from where he lived. He then claims that he drove 150 miles to Imperial County Desert, which was where he had initially planned to go. He then claimed later that night, his motorhome got stuck in the sand and he stayed there overnight and someone came and helped him to get his motorhome unstuck. He then claims he drove to another area and he got stuck again. And why are you driving a motorhome on sand? Like, I can't see that ever working. But this is the story of what he is telling the police. He says that after he got stuck the second time, he got frustrated and decided, you know what, I'm just gonna go home. And, and his story was, extremely suspicious because in the story of all the details that he was telling, there were hundreds of miles that he had driven unnecessarily. He had also told police that he had stopped at about a dozen different places during this time period that he was away from the home. And police just found it extremely suspicious, his story. So they want to go to, they want to go into the motor home and see what's going on. And they noticed that it is extremely clean. When police asked him why, you know, the motorhome was so clean, he claimed that that's what he did every time when he would go out in the motorhome, when he was done and would come home after the weekend, he would make clean it very well, which I mean, that's not necessarily suspicious, but the way he was explaining everything put all together, police found it very strange. One very important thing that he failed to tell police was that he had stopped at a dry cleaner's before he had returned home. So police then want to search his house and he does allow it. And it's very strange because when the police were coming in to search his home, he kept apologizing that his house was such a mess. But when police went inside the house, the house was almost spotless. There were a few things that they did notice. They noticed that the comforter in the master bedroom was missing and there was a basket of dirty laundry sitting on top of his washing machine. The police then proceeded to spend the next two and a half weeks searching David's home. They also ended up finding out about the things that he had dropped off at the dry cleaner. So they had gone and gotten the dry cleaning and they were, you know, doing forensic testing on that. And they also got the cell phone data from his cell phone and the location that it showed that he had driven and where he had gone on which days and what he had done. None of it matched anything close to what he had told police. And despite David's efforts to clean up and get rid of any evidence, there was a mountain of evidence. In a trash bag, they found his bedroom sheets, a pair of his boxer shorts, and a lint ball, and all of them had hairs on them that were very similar to Danielle's hair. They also found hairs similar to Danielle's hair in the bathroom drain. Now, obviously, she, she was a blonde-haired little girl, just a gorgeous little angel. So they're finding these blonde hairs that would match up 
with uh, Danielle. Now, obviously when they find them, they're just visually comparing, okay, th that looks like it could be Danielle's, but then they then go on to actually test the hair to confirm that it is Danielle's hair. Inside of his motor home, police had found fibers that matched the fibers that were on the carpet in Danielle's bedroom. Police then searched his computer and they found absolutely horrific and disturbing images. There was a ton of child inappropriate videos. Danielle was not in any of these videos, but obviously it showed police that he was a very, very sick individual. And you remember a little earlier when I told you about the whimpering dog? Well, that dog, that her name was Layla, and hairs from Layla were found in his home, in the motor home. There was also dog hair on the lint ball and on a towel that was in the dirty basket that was sitting on top of his washing machine. Police also found Danielle's fingerprint inside of his motor home and probably the most you know, disturbing part was they found droplets of Danielle's blood. And Danielle's blood was found on David's jacket, which was one of the things that he had dropped off at the dry cleaners. Police put him under surveillance as they did the testing to confirm if it was Danielle's blood. And it did come back and was in fact, unfortunately, Danielle's blood. And then three weeks after Danielle had gone missing, police arrested David. Initially, they charged him with kidnapping and burglary, but it would soon be changed to murder. When police had got the cell phone data of exactly where he had driven, they noticed a pattern that he had avoided highways and took a lot of back roads. So they started searching the route that they knew that he had driven, hoping to find Danielle's body. And they did discover Danielle's body. She was naked, suggesting obviously that there had been some type of essay before she had been killed. Unfortunately, because decomposition, they were never able to exactly determine how Danielle had been murdered. When they had found Danielle's body, there were fibers that they were able to retrieve that were underneath her body, and they were a match to fibers found in that laundry basket that was sitting on his washing machine. And as if this guy cannot get even more disgusting, when he is confronted about the CP on his computer, he blames it on his 18-year-old son. We already know he's a vile POS, but, you know, trying to put that on his poor 18-year-old son who had absolutely nothing at all to do with any of this. He was not oh, even aware that his father had these types of videos to try to blame it on your own son. It's just so vile and disgusting. And his defense tried to claim like ridiculously, but they tried to claim that the reason why he had hairs and fibers matching Danielle was because she had been there a few days earlier selling Girl Guide cookies. The defense also in the trial brought up that the parents were swingers and these people, they have just lost their daughter. Their daughter has been brutally essayed and murdered. And what the two of them decide to do with their marriage, that they're both openly and into this together has no bearing on their daughter being kidnapped and murdered and everything that that poor little girl went through. The parents, they came out and spoke about it and they said there were a couple of times where they had, you know, had sexual relations with other people, not just, you know, the two of them, but they had never brought anyone into their home there was never anyone around their children. They were very safe about it. And I, I just, I hate when 
defense attorneys try to villainize like the parents in this situation. They have been through enough to have their lifestyle questioned when it has absolutely no bearing on what happened to their daughter. I just think it's so vile and so disgusting. The trial lasted for two months. The jury deliberated for 10 days and they came back with a guilty verdict for first degree murder, kidnapping and CP. Then during the penalty phase, of David's trial. So he's already been convicted. Now that they're going to determine what his sentence is going to be. His niece, Jenny, came in to testify against her uncle. And I just think this woman is absolutely amazing. So she comes in to testify that when she was seven years old, she had been spending the night at her uncle David's house. And he had come in to the room where she was sleeping, he knelt down beside her and started sticking his finger into her mouth. And seven-year-old Jenny bit down as hard as she could on his finger. Good for you, girl. And Jenny's mother, she also testified and confirmed the story that when Jenny was seven years old, she had told her mother about this incident. Obviously the mother never allowed her to ever be around David again. On September 16th, 2002, David was sentenced to death. But because he's in California, they haven't put anyone to death in an extremely long time. So it's very unlikely that he will ever be put to death, but he will die in prison. And just a couple miles from where Danielle's body was discovered, there is an overpass that they named the Danielle Van Dam Memorial Overpass in memory of Danielle. Oh, and I just, I hope that sweet little seven-year-old girl is at peace now. It's just, I can't imagine what she experienced. It's, you know, all of these stories that I tell you are so horrific, but when it involves children, especially that young, it's, 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 it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to know, you know, that she experienced that. So that is the end of today's story. I really appreciate all of you being here and watching. If you'd like to help me out, please give the video a like. If you would like to support the channel, stick around and watch another video, subscribe if you have not, all the magical YouTube things that you amazing people do. And I will see, oh wait, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not, mm, 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 back it up, back it up. I almost missed my outro. Do something today that makes your soul happy and I will see you in the next one.